Uh, welcome everybody to um, Indie Publishing, Make the Comics, Make the Comics You Want to See. Um, and let me introduce everybody from uh, my left to right. We have Kevin Zapp of Zapp Books. Is that pronounced correctly? Uh, Chap. Chap, okay. Um, C. Spike Trotman of Iron Circus. Yay. Um, <laughs> we have, of course, Annie Koyama of Koyama, Koyama Books. And finally, we have uh, Rain Hogan of 2D Cloud. <coughs> um, so uh, I want to initially sort of talk to each of the publishers and um, talk about what inspired you to go into publishing. Um, and uh, while I'm doing that, I'll start to show some of the slides I have for each of the books. And if they wanted to make any comments about uh, the stuff I'm showing that they that they can, or to, you know, these are all fairly recent releases that, uh, that they're kind of interested in, in uh, sort of exposing to the world. So let's go ahead and begin with, um, with Annie. Um, uh, this is a story that anyone who's familiar with Annie has probably heard a number of times, but for newcomers, it's a, she's, it's a pretty incredible story. Um, please go ahead and uh, discuss what inspired you to go into publishing comics. Um, I was a film producer and then I got sick for a long time and I was sent home with a terminal diagnosis, sorry for those of you who know this story, but uh, when I didn't die, I was operated on, I had brain surgery and I survived, so I thought I was working in advertising before then, I loved being a filmmaker and I hated advertising, however, it paid a crap ton of money. So <laughs> when you are sick for a long time and you can't work outside the home, you, you know, yeah. my cost was low. So I built up a nest egg and then because I'm the type of person I am, when I was sick for 10 years, uh, I started playing the stock market. It was the 80s when anybody could throw money at a stock and make money. Did so. You talk into the mic? Sure. Thank Better? You. Better. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so then when I did not die, I decided I didn't want to go back to a shitty job. I didn't know how much time I would have left, so I wanted to do something with art and books. Those are things that made me happy. Those helped get me through my sickness <coughs> days. And so I had this money, and I looked for artists to help. Uh, I didn't need money much then, so I supported them and gave them a project, not necessarily books in those days, but something where they'd have a product they could go and sell it, keep all the proceeds, and then I you know, met a lot of cool people that way. So I met these illustrators and we decided, let's do a book of their doodles, and it was great, and it was fantastic. We figured out how to make a book. We, none of us figured out how to sell a book. <laughs> so I would just schlep it around in my backpack all over Toronto, and everyone took it, but they only took it on consignment. So it's very different than when you have a distributor, which I now do have. So it's nine years later, it's very, very different. So, and then I accidentally found out that all the art bookstores in Toronto were closing at that time, and that's what I wanted to do first. So what, what am I gonna do next? And then I found Michael DeForge, who is a wonderful artist, and um, we started working together, and he got me into alternative comics more than anybody else, I think. So, and here I am today, still doing it. So I still love it. It's a labor of love. None of us at this table, I don't think, I can't speak for Spike, but I know the others, none of us make much money if any money. We, we do it for love, we do because we love what we do. We love the artists that we work with and we love the world that we're in. We wish the market was a little bigger, but you know, we can only do so much. But all these people will tell you more about that. Anyway, long story <coughs> short, here I am nine years later. Awesome, thank you, thank you Annie. <coughs> um, all right, next we have um, uh, Rain. Uh, sort of the same question, um, what inspired you to become a publisher? And you've been doing it to close to a decade as well now, right? Right, yeah. Um, I mean, we started really small, just like making zines and stuff, um, like with a local anthology. Um, it's something that I've always wanted to do, like, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to, to uh, I mean, I, I guess I started from a point where, like, uh, I am an artist, and, like, I uh, had friends that were artists, and, like, w I've always been kind of wanting to push them to, like, make shit, and, um, <laughs> uh, and to, like, and that's, like, my way of, like, hanging out, 
um, is to, to do that. And um, I think it, I think just with time, uh, uh, we as we started a, a small company, and I kind of figured out like over the years like what we're actually doing. It just uh, took a while to, to figure out. But yeah, uh, we just yeah, it's it's such a, a labor of love. Like you know, like uh, it takes like all of your time and all of your money and all of your energy, and uh, but it's like also the only thing worth do doing to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rain. Yeah. Um, and Spike. Yeah. Um. I started making comics around the time that web comics were actually beginning to sort of be a thing. And uh, back then it was, don't do a web comic because it'll destroy your career, which in retrospect is like the singularly most bizarre thing you can probably say to someone now. But back then it was it was very real. Uh, there was a lot of animosity between what are what back then was print cartoonist and web cartoonist. Like there is no distinction now. It's It's even stupid to try, but. They, they were real, and it got tribal, and it got ugly. And the prevailing notion was that if you put an inter a comic on the internet, it was proof you didn't even value your own work because you were giving it away for free. And you, yes you, were single-handedly destroying the newspaper industry because as we all know, the only reason anyone ever buys newspapers is to read the comic section. So uh, I was personally putting tens of dozens of print cartoonists livelihoods in in mortal danger because I was clearly not good enough to work for the syndicate and I was taking out all my impotent rage by by destroying the newspapers and it's like you're laughing but it was so fucking real back then <laughs> and um, quite frankly I always that was like the weirdest kind of criticism to me criticism to me because it's like I never wanted to be in the newspaper ever uh, the comics I was reading were things like Peter Bagg's Hate and uh, Fun with Milk and Cheese. Uh, I read Hepcats. Uh, there was another one called uh, He is Just a Rat. Um, I was reading a lot of sort of post black and white boom alternative comics. When Understanding Comics came out, you know, when I, when I bought it, it was still like being published for like Tundra, I think. It was one of the first printings of it and it was just eye opening and amazing and I wanted to make alternative comics. I wanted to make something that would be published by Caliber or Kitchen Sink Press or Slave Labor Graphics or all these other publishers that aren't around really. And I knew that's what I wanted to do but I also understood that I would have to prove myself before any of these people would give me a second glance because there was very little money in alternative comics and they could only prove, you know, they could only put out so many books a year. And so webcomics seemed like obvious to me. So I started a webcomic and around 2007, people began asking, hey, when is there gonna be a book? And I was like, okay, guess I'll make a book. And I decided if I'm going to make a book, I should have a publisher. And at the time I was a cartoonist and you know I was super poor and I already had a domain called Iron Circus and I was like, I know, I'll just, I'll just call it Iron Circus Comics because I already own the domain, so I'll save a few bucks there. And uh, yeah, 2007, registered Iron Circus Comics, and it kind of stayed a little sort of publisher of only my work until 2009, 2010-ish. Um, somebody told me about this thing called Kickstarter, and everyone was all like, well, that won't work. And um, the thing that always got me is like, but well, that's already working. Every webcomic artist, you know, us off in the corner that everyone hated, uh, we had been kickstarting books before there was a Kickstarter where we would take PayPal donations and have a little thermometer graphic on our website. And it's like, I need $6,000 to publish the book. And every day we'd go and we'd update the thermometer. And I was like, well, I mean, that already works. This just makes it transparent. This is like an improvement. So, okay. And I put a project up there for a book called Poor Crafts, and I asked for $6,000, and I got 13000 And I will never forget that project for two reasons. It's like the time it launched, I was trapped in an airport because Air Force One had made an unscheduled landing at the airport. And when Air Force One lands at your airport, all air traffic is grounded for the foreseeable future. No one else is allowed to fly as long as Air Force One was there. So uh, I was in a, within a mile of Barack Obama, very exciting. 
And back then I had a flip phone and my husband was updating me on how the Kickstarter was doing via text messages on the flip phone. And I was pacing the waiting area like a crazy person because he'd be texting me every two minutes going, oh my God, baby, it's up to a thousand. Oh my God, baby, it's up to 2,000. Oh my God, baby, it's up to 3,000. And I'm like, oh my fucking God, free money. Oh. And I became like this evangelist for Kickstarter and I've used it in all my projects. Uh, I think the biggest project I've ever had was Smut Peddler 2014, and that did like $180,000, which honestly these days isn't even that big a deal on Kickstarter, but it has been the kick in the pan. Like, it's literally been the Kickstarter for Iron Circus. The reason I can do any project I basically want to is I can put it on Kickstarter, and the run is paid for before I even send it to the printer, and it's been a huge boost, and it has been ins instrumental in letting me ramp up production, which I've done this year. I announced a whole line of books by independent creators, uh, graphic novels by people like Mel Gilman and Blue Delaquanti and other creators I'm super excited to be publishing. And um, yeah, I finally got distribution. And when I mean distribution, I don't mean diamond. I mean like an actual distributor who gives a crap this year. Yeah, I said it. And um, <laughs> I'm really, really excited to see where that goes. Thank you. And Kevin. Um, so as I'm a cartoonist and Chapbook started as sort of um, basically an outlet to self-publish my work. Uh, it's coming from a background of DIY punk zines and Bill Watterson screeds about like uh, <laughs> controlling your comic and all the uh, possibilities. And um, so it was basically just putting out my own uh, comic zine style on a Xerox machine. And I also happen to know um, some people I went to art school with who are really good at comics, uh, friends I grew up with, like my good friend Liz Suburbia, who's also making work. And I was like, you know, this is a big table at, a, at my first convention to fill. How about I sell comics for you? And, um, you know, I'll just give you the money and, uh, you know, uh, I'll be selling my stuff, your stuff, everybody benefits, and I'll like drive there and do a lot of stuff. So it started from there, and over time it kept like building and building. I would meet other cartoonists at the shows, and we would hit it off. It's like, your work is really great. I'd love to sell on the table. That eventually turned into doing an anthology, and um, I started Puppy Teeth with uh, my friend Liz again. And then over the years, it just keeps evolving and, vo and evolving. And, um, I love comics so much, and I'm such a cheerleader. My friends call me the comics mom, which I've kind of <laughs> adopted as my official title. But um, I just love uh, promoting comics, and specifically these amazing comics by my friends. And um, just a world where comics, like any different kind, like poetry, abstract, uh, adventure, out of bio, it's like it should all be there. And so. Um, Again, over time, that's evolved into more of a concentrated publishing effort. And then about two or three years ago, I decided to take the leap from doing um, just varying anthologies to doing single issue or uh, single artist work, um, a lot of the same people who were in the Puppy Teeth. And um, from there, we've uh, published Laura Knetzer's Bug Boys, um, my own book, Future Perf. Uh, this year, we put out Ulcera by two Brazilian artists. And um, we also, sort of as a side, um, a side imprint, where, which gives us even more reign to uh, publish different kinds of comics. Uh, my friend Il Nichols, who does Grindstone Comics, we both uh, decided to put out this series called Ley Lines, which uh, we call it a, a series of fine art fan comics. And we were, we've always been really interested in the idea of um, comics that are influenced by more than just other comics, like you know, old newspaper strips, like things like paintings, Picasso, or Hieronymus Bosch, or even Kylie Minogue. Um, so that's been, we're on our second year of doing a quarterly um, subscription-based service with the ley lines, and um, yeah, we're really excited about everything that we put out in that and what's to come, and um, sort of, Going back to Kickstarter, we just had a Kickstarter to give us a push, and um, it was, you know, successful beyond my wildest dreams, which um, I have pretty modest dreams, but it's still <laughs> very nice to uh, have that 
push and um, you know Annie's always been really supportive of us for a long time and she was you know I think she was the first person I told when I decided I wanted to make chat books more of a, an official publisher and she said oh I'm so happy and that was kind of like all the uh, encouragement I needed it's interesting how organic all these stories are, like yeah. how everybody here is like, well, I just started off doing this thing I really liked, and then it exploded in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then um, just to add one final thing, sort of what propelled me to actually publish other people's work is um, I've always been sort of like a, a comics history and culture nerd, and just like seeing how things um, you know, the landscape is formed, it really impressed upon me that um, you know, if you do want to see this world of comics, you need to, you know, have a voice in it. And so by publishing other people's work, I'm sort of putting in, like, this is how I feel the culture should be. And that goes to both the kind of work we put out, the artists we publish, and um, sort of our methods for running the business. So. Yeah, I, I get asked sometimes, like, how do you decide, like, who makes it into anthologies or how do you decide who you publish? And I mean, it's just a matter of like taste, honestly. I, I follow my gut when I see someone's work I really like. I, my first impulse is I must publish you. <laughs> and I send a lot of really prying emails to like people I just find online or on Tumblr or at cons who handed me a mini or something. And I'm just like, I really like your work. Have you ever thought of doing something a little longer, like graphic novel length? And there's like nothing complicated. It's just a matter of taste. and. My taste tends to, all right, there are these two quotes I really like. One of them is, be the change you want to see in the world, and I don't know who said that. And then Cicero, who said something like, I criticize by creation. And comics, until very recently, I would argue, leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to subject matter and it comes to both who is on the page and who is behind the scenes. And the small press, especially recently, has been moving in leaps and bounds to sort of compensate for things the mainstream just like can't be arsed to do. And I, I think places like SPX and also places like, you know, TCAF and VanCAF and the right parts of ECCC and other uh, shows like that with, you know, really strong alt comics and small press comics presence, it's, it's like night and day. And it, it's been so refreshing just to see that change. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad I actually brought up the the question of um, what you look for, mm -hmm. and and it's very clear in looking at uh, the publications of, of the four of you that like um, <clears throat> you're not a publisher. I'm guessing any of the four of you who does a lot of say heavy editing, and actually that's something. I'm, if you if there is any editing, I'm I'm curious to ask if anyone does it, or how much influence you have on the artists that you're publishing. Um, but often in small press, the editing really just takes <coughs> place in the fact that you've chosen someone, that you're, you're like, I'm curating and you know, I choose you because you fit. Um, and I'd ask uh, the other three publishers sort of, what do you look for um, when you are choosing someone to publish? Because I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of you are choosing other people to bring in, but I imagine you're also getting some submissions. Um, uh, if uh, sort of talk about like some of maybe some submissions you've actually gotten that like have surprised you that you've wanted to publish, and I'll sort of talk about um, uh, <coughs> what you're looking for when you're seeking someone out to publish, and in particular, Rain is someone who like really digs in in the the far reaches and like has brought in like a lot of people into like the comics world for like the first time or the first time any kind of organized manner. So let's go ahead and start with you, Ray, on that. Okay, I mean, like, um, again, like, a lot of it's just, like, been friends, or it's, like, stuff that I've seen online, or uh, people I've met on the tour circuit. And I, and I think, like, I mean, anyone that publishes, like, I mean, if, if you're doing comics, like, we just do it because we love it. Like, again, for the most part, uh, there's just, like, so little money in it. And, and a lot of the people that we publish have, like, very limited to no online presence, so like no uh, real baked in audience or like, uh, or just aren't very good at like promoting their stuff. I mean, some people are, some aren't, but it's that's not what it's about. Like we're just, we wanna publish stuff that we love 
And um, in, ter in terms of like editorial ship, uh, it's, it's really like per project. Like, I mean, we reach out to people that, that we trust and like, um, but also we're like peers, like, I don't know, um, uh, just like talking with different artists and like getting to know them and like, like there has to be trust. And um, uh, so sometimes like maybe I'll suggest something, but they uh, don't have to listen, like, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I actually did this panel, a version of this panel, eight years ago um, with an entirely different group of people. And one of them was um, a man named Dylan Williams, who was a publisher of Sparkplug Comic Books. And they were one of the very first um, publishing concerns that was like this. It's like he was a guy, he had very particular aesthetic um, that like only he understood. Was like <laughs> he had a very particular taste because when he looked at the books he published, no two of them were exactly alike, and it was like connecting the dots was difficult. But for Dylan, it made sense, and he never did any um, any editing, and in fact, resisted giving any feedback whatsoever to his <laughs> artists, other than saying something like to someone, um, <clears throat> you know, I want you to do a book, and I want it to be a full length book for someone who'd only done mini comics at that time. And that was the only advice, you know, and, and you basically sort of let the artist fill in from there. Or he told a different artists, take your time with this. Don't rush it. And that was it. Or someone else he would say, you might want to watch this movie, um, mm -hmm. as, as cryptic as that. And um, that sort of got that sense, I'm, I'm guessing that Rain is a similar way in many of the people on this panel. and. Um, let me move on to Annie with this question of um, how much discussion, how much back and forth, and, and how, much, how much do your artists like look to you for any kind of input? Uh, I started the same way with uh, Rain and Dylan, but I found more and more that um, some people come to you and they want editing. So I'm totally open to you need to tell me that because I generally like to leave you alone. However, once we got into bookstores, big bookstores, Covers are really important, so you can't just do any. You have to have a good cover. Uh, and whether it means we have to put, you know, the scratch off lottery stuff over penises so it can go in a <laughs> store, <laughs> but uh, I'll make it work. So bring oh, me wow. a challenge. That's and, and scratch. Well, I tried to sell it with the penises first, but the. That's awesome. Who doesn't want to see a pen? So I had, to, <laughs> I had to cover it up. So you find solutions. It's, I like this cover. Yeah, that's I didn't awesome. want to change it. So how can you fix that? So you're, uh, if you are a film producer, you're a problem solver. If you're a publisher, you're yeah. a problem solver. That's our job. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you know, I may not be creative. I'm not, I'm not an artist myself. Uh, but you can come up with creative solutions with the artist. And, you know, that part's fun. Um, some people have brought me really long stories, 10 pages of one story in a collected book. And that story really only warrants maybe two pages. Uh, and there's not enough payoff. So that kind of thing, I will suggest that maybe you might want to shorten it. Um, I don't do it with a heavy hand, though. But some people want a lot of editing. And uh, Michael DeForge, I just yell at him to make it legible. <laughs> and, and then I leave him to do whatever he does. So it's different with every artist. So I now open the door more to editing, but I prefer a lighter touch. <laughs> what about you, Spike, with regard to like editing and um, back and forth um, with your artists? It's very, how I edit, it, it depends on the creator I'm working with. There are people who I literally email and I go, hey, you want to do X, Y, Z? They go, sure. Two months later, I get something in the mail. and. What I do there is I spell check, and that's as far as the editing goes. There are creators like that, and I'm perfectly happy to work that way with them. And then there are creators that want me to go over their outline, and then want me to go over their in-depth outline, and then want me to go over their script, and then their thumbnails, and they want red lines, and they want everything. And those are the two ends of the spectrum. And I am, if I want to work with you, I want to work with you. So basically, I'm willing to accommodate you. And I find that on the hold my hand end of the spectrum is usually people who are newer to publishing, or this is going to be their first big graphic novel, or their second, or their only non-anthology submission thing they've ever published. And they want 
in my experience, a ton of guidance. And then there are people who have been at this for 10 years who are all like, yeah, it'll, it'll be there, you know, before the deadline. And it shows up and it's, you know, immaculate like baby Jesus and you don't have to do anything. <laughs> but whatever they want, I'm up for. But I assert my will when it comes to um, things I feel strongly about. Like someone submitted a comic where a character was, quote, said something like, you screamed like a little girl. And I wrote them back and I was all like, hi, um, I'm, I would like you to change this to screams like a baby because casual misogyny. And he was like, oh, oops, okay. And so he changed that. And so there are like little things like that that I'm, I'm kind of inflexible on, but for the most part, how heavy an editorial hand I have is up to who I'm working with. Kevin? Yeah, uh, kind of echo a lot of the same thing. Um, initially, uh, I would just, when I would you know, ask somebody to work with me, I'd say, you know, I totally trust your vision and I want to like see that through to the end. Um, but I also found over time more and more people were coming with uh, requests for editing and more guidance. And um, so it's sort of been an evolving process. Uh, it was really interesting for Ulcera, which is actually an English translation of a, the Portuguese original that um, they de debuted in Brazil. And uh, that one, I don't speak Portuguese or read it, but I uh, helped them out with some of fine tuning the English. and. Um, and uh, there was a bit more of an editorial hand on that. And, uh, but mostly, um, besides that, it's kind of, I express most control over the packaging and design. That's part of what's fun for me. Um, so kind of like, yeah, covers again, and um, just how the overall book, uh, the look and feel. But copy editing, too, that's a different kind of editing. I'm not light-handed about that. I'm Mussolini-like about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, you're a book publisher. You're going to be in bookstores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, why, why treat comics readers differently? You know, grammar is grammar. Yeah. You, know, you might as well have it correct. Why have a typo if you can avoid it? Right. That stuff seems little, and there's tons of it. But I hire an outside person, mm -hmm. and then we do four passes in-house. In the early days, I did it with two people, and I know it happened in the first Julia Wirtz book, and I know Rob Clow will remember this. Mm -hmm. The uh, printer, the wrong files went to the printer, and so because our timeline was so short, the one with that had not been finalized in the corrections was printed, oh God. and I didn't have time to fix it in time for the release. Oh. So that kind of stuff is terrible, and it, it, it makes a very bad impression. Uh, ultimately, that's on me. So I've let Julia down. It, you know, I now know not to make those mistakes. But you know, newbie years, all yeah. that shit happens. Yeah. But you can prevent that stuff. So that's a real different kind of editing. And so as loose as we may seem about you know how we do the other stuff, that stuff is pretty non-negotiable. Yeah. You honestly, if you're looking to publish anything, hire someone to read the book before it goes to press, please, because you're looking at it, but you're not seeing it. You you've sat there and you've been reading it for the past three months and you are skipping right over the that's spelled H-T-E, you know, and you just don't see it. So all of my books have a, have a proofreader. Yeah, that's something I have to get better at. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, me. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess like back to covers and stuff, that is like something that like, uh, we're st we, we still try to make them kind of like bookstore friendly but also we do give like a lot of creative control to our artists where sometimes like our distributor has told us like maybe you want to do this and I'll like pass on their suggestion to the artist and sometimes the artist is like nah it's okay <laughs> 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 but I'm, I'm sure sales probably will be impacted <laughs> um, I'm curious about uh, the financial models you have especially with regard in relation to the artists about um, how much money they get, if they get money, uh, if they get advances, if they get royalties, how you work that out, and also how much um, how much of an impact uh, those who have done Kickstarter or their fundraisers have on your ability to actually have money to work with to give to artists it's in addition to actually doing the legwork of publishing the book. And uh, let's start with Kevin this time. Okay, um, so I sort of in, you know, I'm relatively uh, new, especially compared to the rest of the panelists, but over the past couple of years, I've uh, sort of put together uh, 
a payment model that sort of mixes in advance with uh, copies of the book and um, and a bit of a royalty, so a percentage. So trying to think of what is giving them the most money up front that's not totally making this impossible to do. And um, with the Kickstarter we just had, um, I it was really great in that regard because Basically, um, the stretch goals were just paying more money to the artists, and um, and it was really great to finally get that money in the bank account, and then send PayPal to the three authors we were publishing. And uh, it's one of the best moments of my life. My best friend uh, texted me as like, "That really saved my ass. Thank you so much." And it was like, "That feels great." And um, and definitely a huge part of the impetus to having the Kickstarter and sort of doing this push to raise a lot of that capital up front was so that I could, I could offer better in incentives and better payment to the artists because, um, you know, I, it's not something I, if somebody asked me, you know, what do you pay your artists? I couldn't really say the number and not feel like, you know, a tiny bit of shame or like, oh, I could do a lot better than this. And so it's going to be better moving forward. Thank you, Spike. Um, well, the whole, uh, the better the Kickstarter does, the more money the artist makes. That was me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that is a thing I, I, in, I invented for the um, Smut Peddler 2012 Kickstarter, where I was, frankly, like Kevin, I was ashamed by what I could afford to pay people. And when that Kickstarter launched, um, that was back before I had sort of like the street cred, like I couldn't hold off payment till after the Kickstarter. and. You know why would anyone believe the Kickstarter would work? So I had to pay, pay them a certain amount up front. Back then it was fifty dollars a page up front, and then I promised them when the Kickstarter went through, they would get a bonus based on how well the Kickstarter did. And when I pressed launch on the uh, 2012 Smut Peddler, it I think I had like three hundred dollars left in the bank. So I couldn't have published it. Everybody got paid, but if that Kickstarter failed, I couldn't have published the book. And uh, it went on. It asked for 20, and it, it went on to make like 80, and uh, everyone got a big bonus check out of it. And that's kind of what I've done ever since. And I try to be really public about the more the Kickstarter makes, the more money the creators make, which is twofold. It encourages people to back the Kickstarter and not wait. And also, all the participating artists basically become a de facto street team. They start pushing the Kickstarter really hard when they might not otherwise because they know this might mean like an extra 50 or 60 bucks for them. And that, that does make a, a ton of difference. Um, that's how I handle anthologies. The whole, the more the Kickstarter does, the, the better paid the artist is. And when it comes to single paid creators, the contracts I offer, I understand that people don't have to go with me. You know, they could go with anybody up here or they could go with like, um, I don't know, uh, first, second or uh, youth in Decline, there's a whole bunch of really good publishers out there that are like me, that are like hungry starving wolves on the prowl for, for interesting talent. And uh, my incentives when I sign individual creators to produce one person books is it's a signing bonus, not in advance. It doesn't come out of, super, uh, doesn't come out of future earnings. And uh, my payouts, mo a lot of publishers do quarterly. I, I do uh, monthly. So every month you get a statement and you get a payout. And, that has been enough to, well, you see who it worked on, you know, <laughs> go to my website and you'll see all the books I've announced. But um, yeah, I, I am a big believer in paying people a fair price for their work. And I'm a big believer in, frankly, rewarding loyalty, as weird as that sounds, where if you want to work with me on one book, I'll pay a certain rate. But if things go really well and we can put out a second book together, then your pay goes up, you know, and that has worked really well for me so far. Um, there's a contingent that believes they should be getting $250 per page up front, and uh, they're wrong. And, <laughs> and um, I kind of want to stress that everyone up here, we are the small press. You know, you're not going to find Marvel rates here. You're not going to find DC rates here. And that's sort of something you should understand. Partly because there's not that market. Yeah, seriously. It's yeah. like Marvel is selling 
I don't even know, tens of thousands of copies of a certain comic every month, and they are also an international media conglomerate. You know, it's so when people on Tumblr, because of course, where else, start making noise about, you know, why does Marvel pay this and you only pay that? It's like, because they're Marvel and I'm me. Because you saw their movie. This <laughs> yeah, because you saw their movie. Because you can't walk 10 feet downtown without someone wearing a Captain America shirt. <laughs> Annie? Yep, uh, I've backed a ton of Kickstarters in the past, but I don't use it for my own company. Uh, for the first five or six years, I used the stock market and advertising money. I sold my car and sent my first artist to Japan for <laughs> promoting their book, which was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I shipped, I think, 80 books to um, Japan from China, and there are three hulking white dudes, and they, I think they sold eight books. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you could have a panel about publishing errors, yeah. <laughs> publishing yeah. mistakes, and it'd be pretty funny. But um, I pay in advance and a royalty. I also give my guys up to 100 books for free that they can sell mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, that's that nice. becomes an extra royalty because they can keep, they can sell a $15 book, keep it all. Um, they can buy more cheaply from me if they need or just get them for free. I try and take my guys to sh as many shows as I can. Um, I try and, because I work with a lot of emerging artists, I don't just stop at books. So. I try and send my people as much as I can afford to residencies or related things. If they want to go make a film, I try and support them. But I really am a firm believer in if you don't support all of these guys, we all go down. So I help Kevin with ley lines because I think it's one of the most exciting things that's out there right now. Mm -hmm. um, I've helped other people print stuff behind the scenes. Um, if I won the lottery tomorrow, that would be amazing. <laughs> I would, I, honestly, I could feel like I could quit and just do that from you know, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So you can, however, I had to get into the grant lineup in Canada a couple years ago after my own savings ran out. So now I line up with everybody else in Canada, and it's a very stringent process. And if you do 20 art books like I did last year, you get punished, and I got banished for a year. <laughs> so I have no Canada Council money, except Aww. where other big publishers do. So that made it a little harder, but I, you know, I, I like a challenge. <laughs> There's other ways to get your stuff out there. So I have to be beholden a little bit to that if I want to continue. But the bigger thing we have to pay attention to is you won't see all of us if the market to buy our books does not exist. So in five years, if we can't try and grow that market a little bit or keep introducing new people or growing, you know, people you already have. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm on the third or fourth book with some people. Some people will only do one book with, and it may not be because it's not a great seller. It's just maybe the next book is not a great fit for me, but it could be perfect for you yeah. or Kev or Rain. So it's you have to work back from those selling numbers now. So I can't, I'd love to give everyone like a huge advance and then not care about yeah. it anymore. You don't have to pay back the advance if, you're, if you don't work off that advance. But if I can't pay back my printing costs or whatever, I'm bad at math, but you can <laughs> do the math there. I, I'm not going to be around in a few years, so yeah. I would like to be around in a few years. Yeah, honestly, it's like this the small press is, I mean, the first word is small, you know? <laughs> it's like I, if, if it is your goal, and I'm not judging anyone because we all have, like, different needs, but uh, if it is your goal to be making $250 a page, I don't know what you're doing here. Like, you need to be boning up on drawing every single individual muscle group you know, with perfect cross-hatching and getting in line to talk to a Marvel editor because that's where you're going to find that kind of pay. <coughs> and let's end uh, with Rain. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm like super fucking broke. Um, <laughs> like, like uh, if, it, if it wasn't uh, um, for like my uh, mother-in-law, like I would be homeless. Um, like literally like all, like I have a day job, all of my money like goes into uh, uh, just keeping the lights on. And like everything's like we like everything's always like uh, uh, we just have to put everything into it every day, and like that's the only way to uh, uh, keep uh, functioning. Um, but it's it's uh, yeah. I I wish I could uh, pay better. I wish. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, but yeah, we've been doing. We also do a lot of kickstarters. Um, but we do them in collections of like 
uh, different books that kind of like are curated and uh, fit together in a, a nice bundle, uh, maybe inspired by like cable companies or something, <laughs> <laughs> in that you can get a bundle of channels. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a real struggle just staying alive. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be moving to the model of, uh, what are they doing, like uh, publishing seasons? Because I don't want to end up running more than two Kickstarters a year, but Kickstarter is it's part of my business model now, and it's, it keeps me afloat, and it keeps everyone paid. And um, even though I now have distributorship, so, you know, 2017, look for Iron Circus books in actual real bookstores, um, I still have to, you know, pay rent on the office until then. So. Thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, a quick question or two. <laughs> Beware. Um, go ahead. Hi. Hello. Yes. Thank you, guys. This is great. I just wanted to hear your advice on choosing printing companies and differences between working with America, Canada, and China. OK. Um, it's hard to find an American printer that will print pornography. Um, I have had to go to Canada for that. And uh, the Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, the Canadian printer I use right now, uh, if you want to come to my table and take a look. Um, they printed Yes Roya, which is my uh, threesome femdom 1960s comic. And it turned out, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it turned out beautifully. And uh, they're called Webcom. I know that's a weird name, but you know, they get an official plug from me. That's how satisfied I am with their work. Um, Chinese printers, basically, the two big things I've figured out you have to worry about is uh, the Chinese, I think it's like the ho the holiday month where basically nothing gets done for a month in China. And uh, that boat will take roughly two months to get across the Pacific Ocean. And then something might happen where a crate gets flagged when it's on the dock for random searches because they're looking for like cocaine and stuff. And you need to build that into your expected delivery date. and. There are a lot of like tips, tricks, and hacks you can use for printing in China. Like, There's a company that will coalesce everybody's print run into one shipping crate and save everybody a ton of money on shipping. And it's just one of those things you get told about when you're around long enough. And you have printers that you have good reputations and bad reputations. And they're, if you care about that sort of thing, um, there are printers that make it known that they are ecologically you know, aware and they don't just dump all their affluence into the nearest river. And But yeah, um, Chinese printers, the holiday and the, the weight. Canadian printers, cool with porn. American printers, not cool with porn. And uh, Lots of Chinese not cool with yeah, porn. Yeah, though, lots too. of Chinese not cool with porn too. But yeah. um, the one thing that I worry about always, it's never happened to me, but I've heard about it, is uh, stuff can get stopped at the border in Canada and declared obscene, which is, you know, a big concern when all your printing in Canada is like <laughs> and um, it's all about who's on deck that day there's nothing I can do about it if like some dude fresh from his you know Quakers meeting shows up and he's on deck when you know smut peddler comes through the door I'm probably gonna be in trouble but anyone else have uh, any yeah, I, I print two-thirds in China uh, and one-third in Canada Every printer is going to screw up at some point and make some mistake. Uh, how they Handle work with it. you to resolve that mistake is who you'll continue working with or who you'll fire. Yeah. Um, I'd like to do them all locally if I could, but the price differential is still quite different. So given my choice at the end of the day, I can print 13 books or I can print seven if I were to do them all in Canada. Um, that lead time, though, to get to China and get the boat over and holidays and whatever, that's, uh, that's daunting. So you have to plan really far ahead. But once it's doable, obviously, it's worth. And there's good Singaporean, uh, Malaysian printers. Yep, and South, yeah, South yeah. Korea. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, a lot of trying to get some printing work these days, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of. Yeah. Uh, a lot of our books are printed. Uh, uh, we mostly just use TWP, and they're based in South Korea. Um, they used to have a plant in Singapore. Um, uh, but yeah, a lot of our books have uh, sexual content, and like printing in China, uh, there's obscenity laws. 
Um, we used to print most of our books in the U.S., but yeah, it's just like getting the books uh, priced right so that you can uh, sell them and barely make anything. <laughs> um, yeah, is like it's like any ways you can cut costs. It's yeah, comics are soul crushing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, printing in Canada, uh, printing in Canada is cheapest for me for black and white, but printing in China, it's like you cannot compete anywhere else. It's so cheap. It makes a world of difference. Well, thank you all. That's all, that's all the time we have for this panel. Please give a round of applause to <laughs> our publishers. And uh, please consider uh, heading to each of their individual tables and I'm seeing at what E1. They have. Because um, there's uh, there's some remarkable stuff. So, thanks everyone for come for coming. <laughs>